Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Delta Holtby, and I'll be moderate, moderating today's webinar. I'd like to introduce Stuart Holtby from Get In Sync and Julie Mockel folks from Monjure. Together, they're going to help us unravel the myths and realities around IT contracts. Now, as we move through, be sure to drop your comments, sorry, your questions in the comment section, and we will be sure to address them when we get to the Q&A section. Let's dive in so you can take it away, Stuart. Oh, thanks, Delta. Yeah, I'm Stuart Holtby. I'll just do a quick little intro. I'm the founder and CEO of Get In Sync. And with me, I have Julie. And Julie, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? Sure. My name is Julie Mockel Folks. I am a partner and co founder of Monger, a legal services firm that's located just outside of Dallas. We've been working for about 25 years in the managed services industry. And I'm very excited to be here today. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's interesting, Julie, we met through the ConnectWise Pitch It program, right? A startup competition designed to identify and support those up and comers, innovative companies in the IT industry. ConnectWise runs, and for those that don't know, the program brings together like early stage companies offering unique solutions to MSPs, right? So managed service providers. I know that we're going to use some lingo here. We're going to try and def <laughs> uh, make sure we keep it acronym, with the acronyms down and all of the abbreviations and so forth. But it, but Pitch It was really good. It allows companies really to compete. It's like that Shark Tank thing, gain mentorship, showcase their wares and whatnot. So together we decided, hey, let's combine and do a little fireside chat about what you, what your organization does and what we do, because we both have an opportunity really to share some interesting things about contracts and the VCIO services, and, and we'll get into that in a bit. But give me your spin on the Pitch It program and the, and the twice and how that worked for you guys. Sure. So this was our second year in participating in Pitch It, and we're very much looking forward to seeing the finalists next week at IT Nation. I know some of you might be listening to this after the fact, and it might have already passed by then, but we found the Pitch It program to be very illuminating. It had a lot of opportunities for people who are brand new and growing to learn about marketing and financial reporting, as well as paths to success that other people in our industry and who have participated in the program have experienced in the past. And I find that attending the pitch it sessions, which are pretty intensive, I would say. Very I find intensive. that, yeah, there's many times per week and many hours per session. I found them to be extremely helpful for me and for the team members who participated. Yeah, I agree. I, it's helped us focus and say what we're doing in 30 seconds or less than that kind of thing. So it's a, it's challenging. And for those folks that are going to be in, in Orlando at IT Nation, please come by. We'll both be there. I know, Julie, you're there for the front end of the week, but your team will be there. So will ours and come out and meet us and we'll have some fun. But on this webinar today, what we're really trying to focus in is some of those key contract challenges. And I've, I think I've been in the industry. 30 years, ran my own MSP. We can get into that a little bit more in terms of the history, but this little factoid we have, 80% of IT project failures can really be pointed back at unclear roles and responsibilities. And this is so important in terms of <laughs> what is the customer's responsibility? What is the vendor's responsibility? And how do you lay those out in contract roles? So this is one of the challenges that we're going to try and address today. And we're going to try to bust a few myths too. I don't know if you want to weigh in on this, this challenge. <laughs> What's been your experience? What I find is that, first of all, if you are a, if you're consuming managed services or if you're offering managed services, your contracts can be the most important part of the relationship. But that being said, if you're trying to manage the relationship using the written document, something is going <laughs> yeah. wrong, right? Good, right? So <laughs> what I find, Stuart, is that it's so important to have good contracts and good clean descriptions of the work that you'll be performing or that will be performed for you. It's very important to have that, but at the same time, you have to also realize that this is a business relationship based on trust. Exactly. And you have to, in many cases, for some of those skeptical clients, you have to earn their trust. 
and right. that can only be that can only be done in my experience through delivering what you say you're going to deliver and that starts with saying what you're going to deliver right <laughs> and so you have to have a good benchmark against which you're going to deliver your services and the contracts are a great way to start yeah, exactly. A good structured contract really eases that. People tend to just throw it in the drawer and everyone's aligned to that, right? And so just as we talk, what I want to do is introduce a few things that I've heard in my travels offering what is known as VCIO. And we'll get into some of the definitions here and what the controversies are. But the VCIO is, a, is an acronym or a term that we use in the industry. And there's this myth out there that you can't serve as their VCIO. And like I say, we'll explain what a VCIO is for those that don't know <laughs> later on, but that's one of the big myths that we're here to bust. And another myth that we're going to try and bust is just that any contract is better than no contract. And I know that there's some lingo in your industry too, like MSA, SLA, SOW, or sometimes referred to as a SOW. Are these myths, I guess, if you will, spoiler alert, we're going to bust both of these myths. A badly written contract is worse, right? Than no it is, contract fact, at all. <laughs> it is that, and I have some, I have some good horror stories about that. Into okay. that, in just a little we'll while. We'll definitely get into that, and that's the thing. There's a lot of hidden legal risks, and so we're using this analogy of the iceberg, and just this whole idea of how do you really vet this, and how do you know? And if you look at what above the water, so the common risks, you've got to have a contract. Hopefully, it's written well, and it's not just something you, you cut and paste from somewhere else. But then there's the known knots, right? You've got to be careful in terms of payment terms and all that kind of stuff, right? I think those are the blocking and tackling. But Julie, what I'd like to just hit on is what I think happened in July, that crowd strike issue, right? So the outage affected like eight and a half million uh, Windows computers, right? Like I, I think everyone understands what happened there. It was a worldwide problem. In fact, actually, it's possibly the largest outage ever recorded in terms of the impact due to cloud, cloud strike. And for those that don't know it, it was a, a patch that was applied and then it made eight and a half million computers inoperable for a couple of days. And some of some flights were canceled and all lots of chaos I think people knew about. So those are the hidden hazards, right? So how do you help MSPs avoid some, some of that, those kind of issues, right? The legal talking points there. <laughs> Sure. So first, I'm just going to take a step back and say I really yeah. love this infographic of the iceberg. And the reason I really like it is because I can't tell you how many times I have encountered an MSP that thought they were cruising along in the water and everything was great. And then all of a sudden they hit a, an unavoidable iceberg and sank and completely <laughs> went out of business. And so these risks are real. These risks are large and they really do need to be addressed. And I think that the first thing you could do is understand that they exist. So let me use the CrowdStrike example, if you don't mind, Stuart, Absolutely. to illustrate why I think that this risk is so important. So what we have to do is we have to identify that it is possible for third parties, we have to identify that the third parties could cause us a huge set of uh, risks. And so what we're looking at is a problem where people were, in many instances, using CrowdStrike. It is definitely something that a lot of people recommend for security purposes and to help them achieve certain objectives. And they did not realize that they needed to be disclosing the involvement of CrowdStrike in their service bundle. And so what happened was when CrowdStrike went down and people started calling their MSP and saying, what the heck is going on? They, the MSPs suddenly were scrambling saying, oh, this is a third party. We use this third party to help you with security. Something has gone wrong. And if that's the first time that your customers are hearing about your relationship with CrowdStrike, that's going to be a problem. And so what we have to do is identify these risks by saying, who could possibly fail in the bundle that we're using? And how can I communicate that in a meaningful way to my MSP customers so that those customers and those risks can be clearly articulated to your clients and clearly managed? 
I think that's great. And those are that's where the VCIO, which will give you a little more definition, but it's that technology leadership or the strategy side of IT that would really step up and help you identify all of those things that need to be in those contracts, managing that relationship, making sure the customers are aware and walking them through, if you will, those, if you will, the hidden hazards and making sure that those are identified. And that's what we're really talking about is that VCI role that IT strategist really taking that technology leadership in regards to contract management and it's such an important area. And it's not just, I don't want to make sound like you're just covering your ass, if you will, but it's helping the organization understand just exactly what you said, all the risks under the water and what you've got to watch out for. So if we can, I'm going to turn to one of the myths, Julie, and this is where we get into that initial myth that I introduced. There's a lot of talk on Reddit and whatnot, and it was, no, you cannot serve as their VCIO, and, and it's, wait, what? <laughs> How come, right? What's the issue here? And people are worried about the insurance claims being denied. You're taking on a lot of risk because you're acting as the officer or the chief. There's those words in in the name. And really, what what is a VCIO exactly, right? And I mentioned this earlier on, it's really the technology business leader leadership that uh, helps um, with roadmaps and whatnot, mapping that strategy, making sure the business gets what they need in IT. And in co-manage, it's really that partnership manage, uh, management, so that model that we have, that strategic guidance, which really complements the internal IT team. Now, often what happens is that folks are a little bit concerned about some of the risks that are involved inherently in that VCIO. So, VCIO, let's just talk about that for a second. Because it has the word officer and chief in it, does it run a risk or is it just a notional term? That's, I think, where people get a little worried. I'm not really an officer of the corporation, right? <laughs> But I, I do think I, it's a valid and genuine concern. I do, and I do share this concern. And just so you guys know, it's not necessarily just the CIO uh, moniker. It could be any of them, the CSO, the CISO, uh, the CTO, anything that has the word chief and officer in it is potentially a problem. And the reason is a genuine officer of a company chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief information officer, any of those officers owe what we call in the legal world fiduciary duties to the company. And that right. means you can't have any conflicts of interest. And so serving as a virtual CIO for multiple companies in the same industry could definitely be construed in the legal landscape as a conflict of interest. And so what we're trying to communicate is what I consider to be a marketing term by saying we're going to be your virtual CIO. What we actually mean is we're going to provide fractional technological consulting services. That's what we right. really mean. But that's exactly. too much of a mouthful. And so we <laughs> don't really want to say that. What we really want us we really want it to be catchy and cool and say something like that. Uh, say right. something like VCIO, something very quick. Yes. And so what we're looking for is a way to communicate this marketing term without subjecting ourselves to a ton of legal liability. And so can you offer yourself as a virtual or a fractional CIO? Yes, you can, if you're very careful about it. And what you have to say is, when I'm telling you that I'm gonna be your virtual CIO, what I mean by that is I'm gonna provide you with technology consulting services that are akin to what they would do without yeah. becoming an officer of your company. Right. And so you just have to very clearly communicate, hey, I might give you strategic guidance, but I am not owing you any kind of fiduciary duty. I am not accepting a role as an officer of your company. And please, insurance company, don't subject me to higher premiums or reduced liability coverage because I am offering this strategic technological consulting. And that's really important. And actually, there's a... Uh, another cohort in our Pitch It program, Doug with uh, C CPod Scott Cyber, and we had a good webinar, talked about insurance. And really, just what you mentioned there, the agreements go hand in hand, and Doug agrees. It has to be stated clearly <laughs> that you're not an officer, just like you mentioned. It is definitely a concern if you're uh, presenting yourself as one. Uh, you've got to make sure that, like you say, that's really just a catchy term where you're providing that strategic guidance. 
Maybe just let's just touch a little bit on <clears throat> co-managed IT as well. So if I'm in an organization and I'm providing them with advice, there's often people say they don't take my advice and then they get themselves <laughs> into a jam. <laughs> what, what happens then? Do I have to document everything I do? Is that kind of part of the part and part of the game? It's interesting that you asked that question. This is the biggest um, fight that I have with my clients, Stuart, is my clients and the insurance companies that, that, that represent them definitely want every single declination of services documented. But from a legal perspective, this is a terrible idea in the traditional sense that people are expecting. So if you're looking at something where you say, I'm going to send them something called waiver of services or right. notice of non-compliance, and you right. want them to consider that and sign it, you are setting yourself up for a big problem. Right. Because what happens if you send it to them and they say, you know what, I'm not gonna sign this. I'm not gonna sign so it. Now you've no. presented them with the document that you want them to acknowledge, and they've done nothing with it. And it was not, if you have your contracts drafted properly, it's not legally necessary. Exactly. So in my agreement, it says, if I make a recommendation to you in any format and you don't take it, you're responsible for everything that happens afterward. So all I have to do is show you that I made the recommendation. And how can I do that? I could put it in an order that they're gonna sign, recommended but declined services, I could put it in a quarterly business review at the bottom that says accept or decline next to every service that I'm recommending. <laughs> so they could just initial it as a more of a decision instead of a very sternly worded adversarial document saying you understand all of the risks as I yeah, explain right. them to you and you hereby waive them all. Yeah, instead yeah. It just you says, hold us harmless and all that kind of wording. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so instead it just says, I decline MFA, thank you very much. Or it could be something as simple as an email that says, I recommend an MFA to you and you decided not to move forward. Let me know if you change your mind. That's a great, great segue. And, but that's important to mention that you have to have the right provisions in your MSA for that to work. Exactly. And that's where I we're don't at. want I anybody mean, to hear this webinar and go out, start sending those emails and saying, but Julie said I was protected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, so we're going to try to bust this myth about do I have to stop providing VCIO services because I'm I'm crossing the line? We'll get there in a second. But we're going to try to tackle the next myth, and that's any contact contract is better than no contract. And I really like this one that you mentioned, Julie. So I'll let you uh, you speak to this. <laughs> really. Sure. So I have a lot of clients that come to me with contracts that they've cobbled together over the years, either from the internet or AI generated it for them, or they got it from a friend or their friend who's <laughs> yeah. a real estate lawyer drafted it for them. Their next door neighbor. <laughs> exactly. Their cousin's friend who's a paralegal, <laughs> yeah. any of these things, I've seen all of those things. And the issue that I have with ha having any terms and conditions are better than none is if they don't address the real risks in your industry, there are a couple of problems. Number one, they give you a false sense of security. Yeah. Number two, you might not realize what is in your agreement. So I had a litigation matter where I had to go down to court and defend a client. And when I was in the, when I was in the litigation reading the contract, it had a mandatory arbitration provision. And the contract was drafted by the vendor who sued my client. So when I got to court, I said, Your Honor, I have a housekeeping matter. There's a mandatory arbitration provision in this contract. We shouldn't be in court at all. And the court looked at it, looked at the vendor and said, what do you have to say about that? And they <laughs> said, we never read this contract. Ouch. And the judge said, this is your contract. <laughs> and they said, yes, but we just had our friend draft it up and we didn't know that there was a mandatory arbitration and their case got dismissed. Have because to, right? they His hands were yeah, tied. There was, yeah exactly and that is my best example of why you can't just go out with a contract that you don't owe and you don't understand and you don't have anybody to back you up now if they had a lawyer behind them that was ready to back them up and say yes i put this mandatory arbitration provision which by the way is in all of my contracts Right. I, yes. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to have an arbitration provision, but if my clients don't understand to that part and they come to me and say, I have to go fight with them about it, then they, those clients understand that they, that they can come to me and say, Hey, we have to go fight about it. What are we going to do? 
Exactly. And that's part of the whole, the secrets here is like really having that, the transparency of the agreements. And I call them agreements. I know contract has a ick word. Do you use those interchangeably? I do. You know, I use yeah. agreements and contracts interchangeably. Yeah. And I would just say that in addition to spelling out what you're going to do, it also in many instances spells out what you're not going to do. Uh. And that can be very helpful. Um, but it is really important to make sure, and, and this is important I would say more in your internal documents than in your externally facing documents. If you have, for instance, a privacy policy or a written information security plan, and it says in the event of an issue, you're going to do first this thing and second this thing, then you have to make sure that you under that everyone in your company understands that it says that, and then you have to do it. Because yes. if you have it written down that you're going to do something and you don't, and you neglect not only does do that, that eradicate the trust, but that's exhibit A in the lawsuit that I'm <laughs> yes. going to bring when something goes exactly. wrong, right? So and they so said they were going to do this, but you know, failed. Having to, you know. a bad contract is worse than having no contract at all in many aspects. Yeah, because now you you just said it was in there to do arbitration. It's, oh, okay. <laughs> like you stepped on a rake. It's bonk, it hit you in the head. <laughs> Those so, people uh, in that case look like they had stepped on a rake. That's exactly what it seemed like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As we go through this, we're going to continue to bust these myths. But I think the thinking here is, is that make sure that if you're going to have a contract, that you read it. I know that sounds pretty straightforward, but I'd like there's a lot, like you mentioned, that don't. And then, of course, it really spells out those shared responsibilities responsibilities. That's where I find, particularly from a VCIO perspective, you can use the contract and the agreement is what, as a way of really sitting down and getting super clear as to what the role is. Because a lot of the times you could almost, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can use this as a vehicle for sales. Because Absolutely. once you build that trust and those responsibilities, you also say, by the way, I need two hours of executive FaceTime every whatever, three weeks or whatnot to get this to be successful. And if that's spelt out in the agreement, then there's like more teeth to it, would you say? I would say that. I would say that. And I think to circle back to what you were mentioning earlier, it's especially important to have a responsibility matrix in a co-managed IT environment because it is very easy in that situation where you have multiple people with administrative credentials that are uh, accessing and manipulating the data in the system. It's very easy for things to go awry. And I just had a client that had this issue yesterday where there was a, a security incident and an ultimate data breach. And they came and said, why is it that this was allowed to happen in our environment? And we were able to point to the responsibility matrix and say, because your IT professional internally said that you were handling this part mm. of the protection and you didn't. And there, yeah. therefore this happened. Exactly. And the fact that we had a very clearly articulated responsibility matrix that said, we're not doing anything related to security was, is going to save us. Yeah, and I know this is a shameless plug for Get In Sync, but we do have that. We call it a racy chart, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And you just have to make sure you follow that. It's a very simple provision that we put in. And then that way, folks are in the loop that who the business owners are and all of those kind of formalities. But then it's used as a way, again, as a sales vehicle. We also have a project charter that clearly lays out what we're doing and how we're going to do that kind of thing. So all of that kind of stuff is available. Very good. So we're going to bust that myth too. But okay, so now we understand, don't just use your next door neighbor's dog's contract that he wrote. <laughs> yeah. um, you, but you know, if you get, find a dog get, that writes contracts, can you refer them to me? Because I always need experienced counsel to help me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then the other thing is that be mindful about how you're using the VCIO moniker and whatnot. And obviously that has to be built in and explained. But managing contact contracts or agreements effectively is always a challenge, right? Like, And uh, I do I have the most updated copy? Life changes, things, situations change. 
all of that kind of stuff. So I don't know if you can speak to that in terms of, am I always going to be in this legal writing monitoring thing? Sure. That's a really good question. And I would say, yes, you are. And I like to use the example of a will. If you write a will when your children are five years old and you let it sit there forever, then it's not going to be appropriate when they are 25 years old. That's a really, really good example. So what I like to tell people is you definitely need someone to help you make sure that everything's up to date. The legal landscape changes, new laws get passed, new challenges occur. People are getting very creative at trying to get out of contracts that cause them to pay termination fees as the economy worsens. And it is something that you definitely need somebody keeping an eye on. Now, does it have to be you, the MSP, doing that? No, not necessarily. And so what happened when I started working on in this practice area all those many decades ago, I would tell my clients, okay, let's draft your contracts. And this would be a hugely painful, iterative process for them and for me. And then three years later, I would say, okay, everything in our contract is changed. We need to do it all over again. And it was just right, very right, frustrating right. for them because they never felt like they were truly protected. And so the offering that we have right now is a monthly legal service where you get some documents updated quarterly, the ones that really need touching, like these this schedule that identifies who your third parties are, like CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike. We need to make sure that one's always up to date. So we update that once a quarter for you. We also update what services you're providing once a quarter and everything else. What I found is once a quarter is way too often and my clients don't want to have a constant project where we're updating the agreements. Right, and right, so right, we've right. extended that to once a year. And basically once a year I go through and I tell you, hey, Stuart, your contracts need to be updated. And here's what I recommend that we update. It's right. in red lines. It's very quick. You look through them. You say, that looks great, Julie. All of these are approved. And then I just post the newly the newly updated documents to your links so that you can always access the latest version of those documents. Yeah, it's wonderful. And that, that peace of mind, right? I think we talked offline, but it's like insurance. It's like anything. If you can have that peace of mind, you're going to sleep a little <laughs> better at night, knowing that all of those kind of checks and balances are in place. And really, I know that we talked about fiduciary duty, and that's not exactly what the CIO was responsible legally with the organization in terms of their officer. But As part of your services, you should be having a checklist at the very minimum. You've got the right insurance, certificate of insurance. So you've got on both sides of the fence, right? The customer has the right insurance. You have the right insurance. The customer and you have the right agreements in place. And this kind of categorizes everything here, right? The document categories that you're going through. I don't know if you just want to speak to this. Sure, I can. Absolutely. So I... I have several documents that I recommend. This is the document stack that the majority of my clients get. The master services agreement contains the terms and conditions for the overarching relationship. So it can cover the warranties that are affiliated with any software or hardware sales that you're making. It covers break fix and professional consulting. So your VCIO would be in here, right? Uh, But it doesn't contain any particular exclusions or legal language about, for instance, a recurring monthly service. And so for if you wanted to find where the termination fee for an early termination would be, that would be in the service attachment. Uh-huh. And I have two different flavors of the service attachment. The standalone ones are services that not everybody offers. Think pen testing or database administration, right? right, right. right? But the omnibus, it's an internal moniker that we use to designate the five big services that most MSPs offer as a bundle or at least mostly bundled. And so those five services are managed security, managed IT, cloud and hosting, backup and disaster recovery, and voice over IP. So most of our MSP clients are offering some flavor of that as a bundle. And all of those services, the legal language that applies to those services is contained in what we call the omnibus document, meaning it's a collection of terms for the most common managed services that people offer. And then we have documents that define those services. So your schedule of services are when we say we're offering you managed security, this is what we mean. 
so that if somebody comes along later and says, Stuart, you didn't give us pen testing and you sold us managed security. And we think that there's a causal connection between this big outage that happened and the fact that you didn't give us pen testing. I'm going to present your schedule of services and say, I didn't put pen testing in here because we don't provide that as part of this service. Do you see uh, that? Yeah. And that's how I'm going to use that schedule of services, not only to educate clients in the onboarding process, but also to protect you if something goes sideways. And that schedule of third-party services clearly articulates CrowdStrike, Kaseya, ConnectWise, all of those guys. Right, and says, right, this, right. Is what we, this is who we use. This is what we use them for. Here are their terms and conditions. And by agreeing to use our services, you're also accepting all of their terms and conditions as well. Right. And then the document that sends me into a rage on most days, Stuart. It, <laughs> I, it, it may seem like I couldn't possibly be uh, angry about a document, but I could be. And this is the one. The service level objectives. This document is legally meaningless, but my clients insist on having it anyway. So uh, yeah. I and that's interchangeable it. with a service level agreement, right? Like it is. Kind of, yeah. It is. Although I will tell you, it is interchangeable, but it is a very deliberate change from my perspective uh, to call it an objective and not agreement. Yeah, because I'm right. not agreeing to anything. No. I'm it's telling like, you, I have yeah. a goal. I have an aspirational goal. Yeah, that I'm going to lose 20 pounds. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. This is not a contract. It's not an agreement, right? We, we yeah. talked about how contract and an agreement are interchangeable, but objectives and an, uh, an agreement, even though I use the documents interchangeably, those words are not interchangeable because I'm not agreeing to do anything. I'm agreeing that I will try to call you within an hour if everybody in your office right. is down. I like it. I and like the it. reason I hate this document is twofold. Number one, this is the place where if you're trying to manage to this piece of paper, you were doing it all wrong, right? If you yeah, are calling exactly. people, if you're saying, I don't have to call them until four hours from now, you're yeah, going to yeah. lose that client. That's you right. are. But secondly, I have it drafted where all you have to do is respond to their request. And your PSA or your other ticket management system is going to do that for you automatically in 10 seconds for every single level of outage. That's right. that, and so that's addressing this it. document exactly. is just meaningless. And what I find is my MSP clients, they all universally believe that you, nobody would sign up without this document, with a chart, with colors on it that says when the response time is. Yeah, and yeah, yes, yeah. it's true that there are some clients out there that wouldn't sign up because they've been burned by their yeah. MSP who didn't yeah. respond fast enough. However, what I have found is if the client is seeking this document, they're a terrible client. To That's have. right. <laughs> That's what I found. And That's so right. my in, in, in my utopia, in my managed services utopia, this document does not exist. Yeah, no, I'm hearing you. And I, a lot of times people go through that line by line and broken the next day. <laughs> and, you know. and what I have found is for the clients who take my advice and cut this document out entirely, they still get plenty of people signing up. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's not like they call me and say, you've ruined my business because we took out the service level objectives. Yeah. Nobody's asking for them. Exactly. And if they are asking for them, that's a red flag. Exactly. And so the schedule of services too, I imagine that's interchangeable with a statement of work or am I? It is. Okay. No, that's absolutely true. And so the interesting part about how people approach their sales process is that I try to be as, I try to be as flexible as possible. So yeah. I would say that an order, a quote, a, a, a proposal, an estimate, a statement of work, I would say those are all interchangeable, but mainly the content of my schedule of services is going to be all of the content that would be in any statement of work you've ever done. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's all of the possible services that anybody could ever, that you would ever sell. And then it says at the top, these are all of our services. And we're only selling it to you if it's included in your, whatever your ordering uh, document is. I like it. I like it. And so the statement of work is usually something that somebody's going to sign. And so the way I like to do things is I like to put my acceptance and incorporation by reference language in the document that the client's going to sign along with yeah. links to these eight documents. And then when the client signs the statement of work or the proposal, they're accepting all of these terms and conditions as well. And so right. there's no 
part of your onboarding process where you say, okay, thank you very much for signing our proposal. Now we're presenting you with this master services agreement that you will subsequently sign. Yeah, exactly. Which leads us to regulatory. And there's a lot of stuff out there about regulatory. I think it was, is it the FCA or one of the federal agencies that sort of said you have to have a person assigned with these yep. responsibilities? Maybe you can talk to that a bit. I can, sure. So that's called the Glam, the Graham Leach Bliley Act, the GLBA. And the okay. GLBA passed, a, the government passed a law called the Graham Leach Bliley Act, the the U.S. Congress passed the law, and it required one of the federal agencies to issue regulations to comply with that law. And the regulations require you to designate a controller of the data if you are subject to GLBA, which is what right. we call it. And the GLBA safeguards rules requires service providers of regulated industries to have that same controller of the data. And so what we've done is we've collected all of the data privacy and processing laws that apply to any of our clients. And that includes HIPAA, GLBA, GDPR, the California rule, the New York Shield law, the Colorado rule, the Virginia rule. All of those rules are all, oh, and the CMMC for service providers that are providing services to Department of Defense contractors. We have collected all of those in a data processing agreement. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why didn't she say PCI? Because PCI is not a regulation. PCI no. is a private entity's requirements. Right. 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 That's not in there. So if you want to be PCI compliant, you're absolutely uh, allowed to do that. But it's not in my data processing agreement because it's not a regulatory regime. Ah, and then what we good. do is if a client is subject to that particular regulation, and we just say that in the order and we say this client is subject to HIPAA and therefore the business associate agreement and our data processing agreement applies. Very interesting. I, I, that's so thorough. That's the issue. I think the thing is to be able to get that. You mentioned the number of different states, right? Is that something that you look at when I'm coming in as a client of yours, what state I'm in, or does this kind of cover all states. <laughs> so I actually am constantly monitoring all the states and we, and Canada as well, frankly. So there's Pepita in Canada or yes, uh, is, yeah. some people pronounce it differently. Yeah. There's yeah. also the Alberta Health Protection Act. And oh. we just have to make sure that any place that we have any clients that we're constantly, so all across the U.S., that I'm constantly monitoring what data privacy laws they're passing. And so for instance, yeah. Texas just passed a law but you notice, even though I'm located in Texas, I didn't mention Texas in my laundry list just a minute ago. And that's because even though Texas passed a law, it doesn't require the writing, the element that Texas, that California and New York require. Uh -huh. And so that's why Texas doesn't have a written section in my data processing agreement because those other regulations require a written outline of what you're doing. And Texas does not. So there are many states that have data privacy and protection laws, but I don't have to write them down in our data processing agreement because we don't have to agree in writing to do these things. We just have to know about them. That's so awesome. And then back to what you said, the <laughs> know about them. Yes. We, can, we can confidently say myths are busted, assuming you use a service like yours and that you've got all of these industry specific provisions doing the check boxes. And do you like my AI generated? <laughs> I do. I like your perfectly That's, structured legal so, contract. <laughs> yeah. AI generated the graphic, but talks about having that kind of really good structured legal contract. I, I don't know if you to pick off like no hiring of employees that's a pretty important one because <laughs> you know, people are poaching super, people all the time it is super important especially in the u.s in light of the new law that congress passed saying that we can't restrict the employees from right. soliciting our customers we need to have the the corollary in place which is telling your customers don't hire our employees and yeah. just so you know Congress is considering adding that to the law as well. Oh boy. And even though the law is currently halted from enforcement, we're keeping a very close eye on that. But you also have to make sure, I, I would say, that we're addressing the biggest risks, right? And yeah. these are industry specific. The slide that I wrote said provisions, but what I really should have said is risks. These risks, are industry yeah. specific risks, like failed backups, 
I, I think I mentioned in one of our yeah. offline sessions. Horrifying. This is the number, <laughs> it's the number one risk. Is that and everybody I know has a horror story about a failed backup, and Always. you don't know that the backups are failing until it is too late. And so we need to make sure that we have contractual provisions in place to protect you, the provider, even if you mess up, even exactly. if you do it wrong. We still need to limit your liability for that. We need to make sure that we are requiring our clients to have insurance. Let me just tell you this. Anybody who's been an MSP for two weeks knows that your clients think if it has a plug, you're managing it. Even if it's yep. something like your refrigerator exactly. or something exactly. that doesn't. Your coffee pot. Hey, we're out of coffee. My, <laughs> my refrigerator has Wi-Fi in it now. I need you I to know. come and fix the Wi-Fi mm -hmm. in my refrigerator. Everything. Um, Google, all, all the thermostats are connected, the HVAC. Exactly. You name it. Exactly. So they think if it has a plug that you're responsible for it and their um, trade groups are telling them, go hire an MSP because then they'll be legally responsible if something goes <laughs> wrong instead of you. And exactly. so we have to re-educate the marketplace to inform them that we are not, in fact, your insurance provider. And outsourcing right. to us is not going to take on that risk. We, we are there to provide a service and we are expecting you, the customer, to get your own insurance to cover these risks. And there are insurance platforms and insurance policies that will cover these risks, like but for ransomware. Absolutely. Yeah. And so as long Absolutely. as you're doing the right thing as a customer, as an MSP customer, then you can get first party cyber liability insurance to cover these risks. So you don't need your MSP to do that no. because nobody is going to be able to stop all of the permutations of the security risks that are out there. Exactly. And so and instead, what we have to do is work together, do the best we can and make sure we're managing the risk so you don't have a lose the company type of a situation on your hands. And this is such an important point. Work together. I'm going to pick up on that because I'm going to pull on that thread. The reason I say that is this is really what the VCIO role is about, right? It's helping the, the company bridge the gaps between what up until now, have we talked about speeds and feeds and wires and pliers and technology? No, it's all been about strategy and, and making sure that you've got uh, the proper legal agreements and people are, are well-versed, transparency, all of that. And that's what Get in Sync is all about is to try and help people get a grip of all of the, the moving bits, if you will, within your IT landscape. And so we believe that VCIO or that senior technology leader should be helping the client guide them through all of these things, explaining them. And then of course, looping in specialists like yourselves and insurance people, making sure that you're getting the certificate of insurance, making sure all of those pieces are done. And back to what we talked about a little earlier, the intention here is to make sure it's evergreen. You know, don't, it's not a set and forget it, you know, kind of thing. And it's making sure that is that's done in a timely manner, like again, so that it's part of your service. So, so it's part of your offering. We close uh, up here. Any last words of wisdom on this slide particularly? Is there anything that in terms of, we talked about no liability for third party. I think that's covered again. I believe we did that. I don't know, Delta, is there anybody online that has put a question in or? <laughs> Or we don't we have any questions right now. Okay. No. And, and I, I don't know if you want to just uh, sum it up, like in terms of your services, like how can we access that? Because it sounds like this is something that's a no-brainer, right? I, I like to think so. I think there are lots of legal providers out there, but my partner Rob and I have been working in this space for, as I mentioned, 25 years almost. And we have seen everything. And I will tell you that together we wrote all of the agreements that I referenced earlier and every sentence that's in our agreements is there because it was a problem that someone has had over the last 20 years. And there are, I would say, no substitutes for living and breathing in this battle space. hardened agreements. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Battle tested. I'm I was literally just in trial with one of my MSPs all week last week. And unfortunately, they did not have my agreement when oh, their no. dispute arose. And every, I'm happy to report that every single issue that we had to fight about in that trial has already been addressed before the trial in my agreements. So yes. none of that would have happened 
if they had already been on my platform. Yeah. Uh, it's very easy to sign up. We have very low affordable monthly rates and it gives you an opportunity to get up running and protected very quickly. It, there is a project, it, there is an onboarding. It does require your feedback from time to time. But if you tell me I need the expedited version of your onboarding, I can get you up and running in less than a week with minimal feedback from you just until you can get your attention to the to the project because yeah. what a lot of times people say is this has been on my pl this has been on my to-do list for seven for 17 years yeah. and it either i get two versions of this either i don't have any time and i'm gonna get stressed out that i'm paying you for a service that i'm not using because i don't have any time to look at it or i've been using it i've been using my own system for 17 years and i've never had a problem so <laughs> i don't think it's a problem now yeah um, my house has never burnt so, down but i've yes, I still my house has my never fire burned insurance. down before so i don't <laughs> yeah. think i need this house burning down insurance but we certainly have an onboarding structure that works for everyone and it's very easy to get signed up i'm not on our sales team but i do have a very capable and very experienced sales team that can help bring you guys on board and then once you get on board I'll be your lawyer to help you with whatever questions you Super have cool. or getting you implemented. When you think about it, MSPs charge monthly, right? Why? <laughs> it's like we're cut from the same cloth in that regard. This is why I liked it. I, I it used to be a very large upfront investment, and the it didn't correlate with the protections that you were getting, right? So you would pay me right now, and you would get protections for let's say two years. Yeah. And then when I would call you back two years from now, I would say our documents are all updated. I need you to pay me again. And you guys would think it's like getting your oil changed. Didn't I just pay you for that? Because <laughs> two years sounds like a blink of an eye when you think about how much you had to pay to get those original documents. And so now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to more closely correlate the protections you're getting with the cost. So that yeah. way, if you're getting if you're getting protections for an indefinite number of years, and I'm always updating it, let's let you pay for them in the same cadence that you're getting the protections. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's uh, brilliant. And you know, it's, like you say, it softens the blow, but it also keeps you in line with that effective uh, contract management. And so it also turns it into, a, I think, from an accounting perspective, and don't quote me on this, but I think it turns it from a capital expenditure to an operational expenditure ah, as well, which a lot of people like. I think talk to your tax professional talk, about that. Yeah, but. talk to your accountant. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just and just closing up here, get in sync. Of course, here's the the advertisement, if you will, of our software. We we have a whole framework, eight eights. It's called. We take you through a complete framework. And the software is important, but it's the method and the framework that makes it really sing for technology leadership. So it's really that business technology decision making made easy. And we help you uh, with all of these complexities in terms of managing insurance and contracts and various other things. I, I thought this was really good. We're going to end on time. Thank you, Julia. I don't know if you had any parting discussion notes. One of the questions I did want to throw out is maybe another webinar. I'm starting to hear compliance as a service, which sounds a little in, <laughs> in, scary. involved it and scary. scary. Yeah, what's, scary. Up, what's up with that? <laughs> Holy cow, Stuart, that's a can of worms, my friend. I know, um, right at the so end, I thought I'd open it. Here's what my concerns are about com compliance as a service. What I am seeing in the industry right now is you guys going out like it's the Wild West and offering compliance as a service, which is great. But what you mean when you say that is technology checkpoint compliance as a service, not HIPAA compliance as a service, because you guys aren't going to go test and see if their physical filing system is compliant with the HIPAA requirements. And so yeah. by the time I get done drafting the disclaimers that we have to put on there to articulate what service you are offering as compliance as a service and what one you're not, it's such a jumble that people are finding it hard to consume that service in a meaningful way. It's so we're still working. Webinar, right? <laughs> yeah, we're still working through that, Stuart. I do think it's a, a big enough topic for another webinar. Yeah. But what I have found is just like any other service but where it's easy to misunderstand things, we have to be extremely careful about what we're representing to the clients that we're going to be doing for them. Because if you just offer something called compliance as a service and you sell them something called HIPAA compliance, 
it is very reasonable for them to expect that when you sign off on their compliance status and say, we have determined that you're compliant, that they don't have to do anything else. And that is very dangerous. Yeah, dead wrong too, probably. And wrong. It's very <laughs> dangerous and very wrong. You mentioned something earlier in, in the webinar too about pen testing and those kind of things that um, one has to be mindful that you are you may be giving people that false hope or false belief that's got them. It Those things have to be do, done routinely and so forth, I imagine. And so you've got to, again, back to your services, you've got to be real clear. Yes, and I see people saying, we're going to give you pen testing, and what they mean is once a year for an additional charge, after you approve the additional charge, we'll do a pen test for you. And right. that's not what people understand that to mean. And so I find yeah, yeah. that we have, by the time I end up putting all the disclaimers in place that we need to put in place, it's a service that really is not as valuable as it could be. Yeah, and yeah. I, I want you guys to be able to offer these services, but I also want you to understand that there are some parts of this landscape that are so dangerous and so fraught with peril that you have to exactly know what you're doing and how to communicate it, or you're going to get yourself into trouble. Yeah, exactly. And 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 that, that even goes to what you're even saying in publicly on your website and stuff like that. So there's exactly those those are those again the checklists that you gotta go through. I think it sounds like another webinar. I, I really appreciate your time and very interesting to have cross paths. Uh, we'll definitely look forward to seeing you in Orlando. For those who are listening in and not having this on replay, that we're they're gonna be there the fifth through the eighth and enjoying IT Nation and watching the winner of the Pitch It 2024, except the 70,000 that they get as as the winner. Unfortunately, the three of you know, the, we didn't hit the three, but next year, maybe. <laughs> I guess this was there your we, second uh, year. So. This was my second year, so I think that we're not allowed to participate yeah. again. But for me, it was always about the camaraderie of this and exactly. the opportunities to learn and grow more so than the prize money, although pri winning prizes is always fun. Yeah, they're always fun. Uh, yeah. And on that note, I'll say I'll say goodbye. We're, we finish on time. And again, of course, reach out to either of us. We can definitely get you in touch. But I'm sure, Julie, you're on LinkedIn. Just maybe let people know how to get a hold of you. Just on LinkedIn is good. Sure. You can go to LinkedIn or you can go to our website at monjur.com. That's M-O-N-J-U-R.com and schedule a demo with my very helpful and experienced team. Perfect. And we'll put that in the show notes. And for those who want to get a hold of us, you can scan this QR code. I'm Stuart be on LinkedIn, Stuart with a U. And of course, just hit the website, getinsync.ca. We're a Canadian company. All right. Well, thanks so much and all the best. Uh, and we'll look forward to teaming up in Orlando. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thank you, too.